One of the purposes of listening to the Dhamma is to get a sense of possibilities. We read the life of the Buddha to get a sense of what a human being can do. But all too often it's off there in Never Never Land. Something someone far away, far distant time was able to do. But to what extent is it relevant to us? It's good to bring that measuring stick up close. What would it be like to have a mind that didn't have any doubts about the deathless? What would it be like to have a mind that didn't have any opportunity? There was no possibility that it would give in to sensual desire. What would it be like to be totally free of defilement? Do those questions interest you? They should, because they're just, they're directly connected with happiness. We have these tendencies in our minds that make us miserable, and we're so used to them that we don't think that there's another way that things can be. And then we look for our happiness within the confines of that sense of our range, what's possible for us. That's how we keep ourselves hemmed in. There's that image that John Cha uses of being hemmed in. He says it's like being a, a frog down in a little hole. And in the northeastern Thailand, what, the, what do they do with frogs and holes? They take a long wire and they put a hook at the end. And they stick it down in the holes and they pull out the frog. As John Cha says, if it's not by the jaw, it's by the ribs. And if you're hemmed in by your ideas of what you can do, that's your future. Aging, illness, and death are going to come with their hook. They might catch you by the ribs, they might catch you by the jaws, who knows where they're going to catch you. It's because you've hemmed yourself in that you're an easy target. This is why it's good to open your mind to possibilities that you might not have thought of before, and to use that measuring stick. The Buddha talks about even something as simple as concentration. What would it be like to have the mind settle down so it does have a sense of rapture, a sense of ease? Okay, where is the potential for rapture right now? Where is the potential for ease right now? It's there. It may not be blatant, but it's there. One way of inducing rapture is to ask yourself, well, what parts of the body right now feel relaxed, feel okay? And when you breathe in, can they maintain that quality of feeling okay, or is there a little squeeze on them? Try noticing your hands. You breathe in, breathe out, and the flow of energy in the hands. Is there anything that puts a squeeze on the hands, any of the muscles in, in any part of the hand? Okay, can you breathe in a way that doesn't put that squeeze on? How long can you keep that up? And when you can keep it up, can you let it spread up the arms? Or if you don't like the hands, you can try the feet. Look for the potentials that are here right now. The Buddha says they're here. Everything we didn't need to know for awakening is right here. And yet we don't see it. All we see are the things that we've seen before. We don't learn to look at things in different ways. This is why Dogen, the Zen teacher, said that a lot of meditation is learning how to de-think your thinking. Look at the potentials right here with different eyes. Where is the potential for rapture? Where is the potential for ease? Where in the mind is the potential for stillness? What would happen if you developed those and kept at it? And 
wouldn't say sensual desire does come up in the mind. What would it be like not to give in? And what would the mind need to do in order to be able to be in a position where it would feel secure that it would never give in? What mind would that be like? These are good questions to ask. Expand our range. The Buddha says that there are several things that, when you think about them, try to get your head around them, you go crazy. And one of them is, what's the range of a person who's attained jhana? What's the range of a Buddha? And we're not here to get our heads around these things. We're here to pose the question, what would that be like to explore some of that range? That's a useful way of thinking. In other words, we can't define that the Buddha had only these many powers or those many powers, because after all, he was, he was a pretty quiet person in one way, and that there was a lot of stuff he knew that he wouldn't talk about. It's the same with people who have jhana, some of the powers they have. They're not supposed to talk about them if you're a monk. You may mention them to other monks, but even then you have to be very careful. And John Lee was extremely circumspect in this way. About what he knew, what his attainments were. And John Fuang told me that he had been very severely chastised by John Mun. Just when he was meditating out in the woods, say, out in the forest, he'd see a mountain you want to check out. Who are the devas over the mountain? Sometimes he'd mention this to his friends. It was just other monks that John one came down on him hard. He said, what you learn in your meditation in those terms is your business and nobody else's. So we look at the teachings in the canon, and they seem huge, in 45 volumes. And we may suspect that not all of them come from the Buddha, but then there's an awful lot that seems genuine. And even that is just that handful of leaves. And so to get to know that handful of leaves, what would that be like? To really see that when the Buddha says the best way to think about suffering is to think about it as clinging to the five aggregates. He's not defining suffering there, but he's giving you a handle on how to understand it, how to take it apart. Even just these few leaves we haven't, haven't really mastered. So there's a huge range of possibilities. And as the Buddha said, it didn't come from anything else aside from his ardency, his resolution, and his heedfulness. Qualities that we can all develop if we want them. So it's good to let the range of the Buddha's knowledge and the idea of a totally pure mind, capture your imagination. Not so you just think about it, but you ask yourself, well, right now, what am I doing that's getting in the way of knowing those things? What attitudes do I have? Where am I focused right now? What do I like to fantasize about? How is that getting in the way? What would happen if I could drop those things, even for a little while? We've had our imagination distracted by so many useless things in the world, things that have you know, a certain amount of use. But they tend to put blinders on us. They close our imaginations to the larger things of which the mind is capable, your heart is capable. So an important part of the practice is learning how not to let those things get in the way.